system. I attended SUNY College at Cortland, New York, graduating in 1978. I chose Cortland because it was far enough from mom and dad, but not too far. And because my father had a family season pass uh, to Greek Peak, the local ski area. So that was sort of where my head was at the time of expressing my priorities. And by some convoluted process, I ended up studying ice and snow in the Arctic for all of my career as a professor. But I sure didn't start out that way. What happened to me is that I had that one great professor who was teaching environmental chemistry. And one of the things he did is show us the Keeling curve, the CO2 data from Mauna Loa, which showed us that atmospheric carbon dioxide was increasing at about one PPM per year. And now it's increasing at, at two and a half times that much, two and a half PPM per year. And my professor at Cortland was so passionate about what was then a new problem of, of global warming that I became hooked. It took uh, for me only one really good professor to change my life. Well, here at SOMAS, they are all that passionate about their work and are here to help you find to discover your own passions. It is a fantastic group of people for whom I have the greatest respect. So this afternoon, we're gonna to try to answer <coughs> your question, which I think might be, why should I come to Stony Brook and to SOMAS? We have lots of answers uh, to this very important question, including number one, we want to help you, to inspire you, to have the chance to work with you, and help you get on a path to great success and a rewarding and enjoyable career. Number two, SOMAS is very broad, encompassing marine sciences, atmospheric sciences, and sustainability studies. Those happen to be the three divisions in SOMAS, each of which offers degree options that can help you explore your interests. But everyone in SOMAS is united in our desire to help define and take us to a sustainable and predictable future for the planet and its ecosystems and for humanity. Number three, we have great facilities that can help you to probe the atmosphere like this airplane uh, behind me, which I own and operate, and or the oceans like our radar meteorology facilities. As I said, our airplanes, our ship, the Sea Wolf, our labs on Long Island Sound and down in Southampton, and in ways that are fun and exciting. We have internship opportunities and study abroad opportunities in places like Jamaica, Tanzania, Kenya, and places more exotic like Ireland. Number four, our students get great jobs. We know that because we often work with them after they graduate and they make more money than we do. Number five, we are working on new campus-wide degree programs that do things that no other schools are doing, like a multidiscipline minor in climate solutions that can connect you to hot topics that New York State is leading, like offshore wind and other renewable energy approaches. We are working hard to make Stony Brook a totally unique experience. Number six, this is a great place to live. Really, come find out. So let me stop talking. <clears throat> My faculty always wish that I would do that sooner. And uh, introduce one of our marine science stars, Professor Niels Volkenborn, who uses sensors that investigate the metabolism and activity of critters, that's my technical term, in marine sediments to study how marine animals respond to environmental pressures. So let me turn it over to Niels. Thanks very much, Paul. And hi, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. I wish I could see you in person, but hopefully this day will come. So my name is Niels Wolkenborn. 
I'm a professor at SOMAS now for six years, um, and I have ended here my a long journey uh, going. Uh, I'm German, as you may hear from my strange accent. I started off, well, relatively conservative. At the time I was studying, you could choose to study biology or chemistry, and I wish there would have been already such interdisciplinary um, majors in Germany at the time, because what I really learned over the time is even though we as a researchers, we get more and more focused on one thing to really answer the big questions and address the big challenges we are facing, we need to work together on various disciplines. And that is not only natural sciences, but also um, humanities, social sciences, and so on. And I think there are some great ma majors that exactly do that. Um, so growing up in Germany, I studied biology. I did my master and my PhD back in Germany. And I really fell into love, into love with uh, the seafloor, which covers most of our planet. And understanding the processes within the seafloor are thus important for the ocean, for the atmosphere. And um, after finishing my PhD, I, I was on a conference and I learned to know some professors from the US. I never planned to go to the US, but they had some money left and asked me if I would come, like to come over. And that was a great opportunity for me to go to Columbia, South Carolina. I was there for a few years. Then I accepted a job offer in France where I thought I would end, but luckily um, I also got an offer from Stony Brook and it was no question that I want to do this. And my wife and my son, they, we, we decided to come here and never, well, I'm so happy that we did this. Being at a university makes so much fun because you it's not only about research, it's a lot about teaching and communicating with students. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And Long Island specifically is, a, to me, a great place because to some extent, our research is always linked to, um, well, problems that we are facing, challenges, but these are at the same time also big opportunity. And you are really a generation over the next 20, 30 years who need to solve all the problems that my or maybe the generation just before me brought us in. and. Uh, for example, in environmental studies, you will exactly learn to do this. You will learn about earth system sciences. You will learn how scientists have uh, identified problems and uh, have helped help to solve them. And maybe we can learn from past experiences to also solve the problems we are facing now, like climate change, like atmospheric pollution, like eutrophication. So I'm here involved now in several research projects that have to do with coastal water quality, how it impacts organisms. I measure the heartbeat of clams, or I measure how rapid, how fast animals are pumping water into the seafloor. I take images of oxygen within sediments because oxygen is such an important molecule. And um, so I think in environmental science, you uh, environmental studies, you can, you can basically decide if you more want to go towards research or if you want more want to uh, learn about how environmental changes will affect humanity and what are the solutions we are thinking of and what can we do to solve these problems. Uh, in environmental studies, you can do this, but there are also great majors in sustainability studies. And Sharon Pochran is the next one here on the list, a great colleague of mine. We just published a paper together on cockroaches. I never thought I would publish about cockroaches, but you already saw she has really strange animals even at her house. Hi, everybody. Thanks for that introduction, Nails. I never thought I'd publish on cockroaches either. I never thought that I would have a house full of cockroaches and a lab full of cockroaches. Actually, the cockroaches are so disgusting that the building manager doesn't let me keep them in my lab. I have to keep them in my basement. So uh, I'm not coming over for that. dinner. What was that? I'm not coming over for dinner. <laughs> you should see what I serve. <laughs> so I came into, um, into uh, my field because I love animals. I've always loved animals. When I was a kid, I thought I was going to be a veterinarian because anybody who loved animals, that's what they did. And I was dedicated to that, focused on that. I went through three and a half years of college planning on being a veterinarian. I interned with a zoo vet. I interned with a dog and cat vet. I interned with a guy who studies the monkeys that live off the island 
uh, Cayo Santiago in, in Puerto Rico. I, I was going to be a vet. And then just before I graduated, my advisor said to me, he's like, um, Sharon, you don't like medicine so much, do you? I'm like, no, medicine's boring. He's like, why are you going into veterinary medicine? And I went, oh. And so I decided to become an anthropologist. And the cool thing about anthropology is that, listen to what I got to do for my dissertation research. I went and I spent two and a half years living in a tent in Ruaha National Park in Tanzania. I learned to speak Swahili. I followed baboons around everywhere they went. <laughs> I got to know their personalities, their um, who they liked, who they hated, and they do have very strong likes and dislikes as anybody who's watched baboons on TV knows. And when I finished, I was lucky enough, when I got my doctorate, I was lucky enough to come to Stony Brook University for a postdoc. And a postdoc is supposed to be a temporary position, a, a three or four year position that, that um, gives you a, a, a veneer of awesomeness. And mine was really great because I got to work with Patricia Wright who studies lemurs. And I got to go to Madagascar and study lemurs in addition to. So I'm like, yeah, we've got it made, right? What's better if you have to study any animal, let's pick primates because that's fun. Except for then, I had students asking me about conservation issues. And I had students who were asking about the, um, what was happening to the environment and human encroachment. And then what was happening with climate change? What was gonna happen to all the animals and the ecosystems with climate change? And I started thinking that maybe loving monkeys wasn't going to be enough. That maybe I had to do something a little bit different. And I was hired by sustainability studies, which made me super happy because they had, um, they had a vision that they were going to embrace as many students in research as they could. This is the opposite of primatology because as you know, most monkeys don't live in the United States. Most monkeys live in, on other continents. Which means that if you want to be a primatologist in the United States, you have to be the best. You have to be an, a straight A student. Which means that if you have a passion for teaching, you can only teach one student if you're going to take them into the field, which I thought, thought was pretty aggravating. So um, when I was hired by sustainability, I was able to involve many, many students in research. I set up the, the worm lab, which as you might guess from the name, we mostly study earthworms. Um, but also cockroaches, planaria, soybeans, uh, soil microbes. Um, there are probably some other creatures that we study in the in the worm lab too. But you have to you have to admit it that the funniest name you could come up with for a lab is the worm lab. So that's what I'm running with. Um, to date, I think I have. I, I was just putting this together for grant. I think I have. Um, seven papers written with a suite of students. These students are primarily undergraduate students who come and they work in my lab and intern in my lab. Students who come to my lab invent their own projects. They run their own projects. I mentor them. I think at this point I have co-authored with a, a, about 50 undergraduate students in biology and, and uh, the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. I have more if we count my primate work, but this, um, this idea of engaging students in authentic research um, makes me really happy because now I can study the projects that I'm most interested in. Um, I still love monkeys, but now I'm more worried about the impact of pesticides on soil and soil ecology. I will say this about sustainability studies. So I'm here representing three majors. One is um, the the coastal major, which is most like, which is a, a bachelor's of science for people who like environmental science. Also straight up sustainability, which is sustainability, but it's got a um, um, social science angle. So economics, anthropology, um, maybe history. Um, if you're creative, we would take that. And then ecosystems and human impact, um, which I am the director of. And that means if you care about the impact that humans are having on your particular ecosystem that you love for whatever reason, um, come study with me because we can help you um, <laughs> learn more about it. 
I want to just give one. I don't want. I'm very conscious of your time here. I want to tell you one story, quick, about the kind of research that comes out of the Worm Lab. When I first set up the Worm Lab, I had um, I wasn't publishing yet because we were too new, and I had a student come to me, and this student was a, a goalie and on a soccer team, and he was diving into crumb rubber on athletic fields all the time. And in the news, there was a cancer cluster on the West Coast of goalies, um, child goalies, and they were all getting um, a flavor of lymphoma. And he said to me, hey, Pochran, am I gonna get cancer from being a goalie? And I said, I don't know, but let's see what it does to earthworms and soil microbes. And that was the, um, that question led to the, our first two publications in peer review. Now I've been focusing on publications in peer review, but also my students do a lot of outreach and my students do a lot of science presentations. So talk to me if you wanna know about getting involved in straight up sustainability and then it's various flavors. It's my pleasure now to introduce to you Sarah Hamida, who is going to tell you about the one flavor of sustainability that I have, um, I have no play in that wheelhouse. It's all hers, Sarah. Thank you, thank you, Sharon. Hello, everybody. It's such a great honor to be here. Uh, I am going to tell you about myself and, and a little bit of my story, and I hope that will show you, um, that, will give you yeah, that will give you some interesting insight in terms of how truly diverse we are in terms of our backgrounds and what we do here um, in SOMAS. So I'm here for the most part of presenting sustainability, but more specifically EDP, which is environmental design and planning. Uh, now, what am I doing here? Why am I in School of Marine Atmospheric Sciences? Um, when I was doing my, I think I need to say something like what Niels also said. Uh, you can't tell from my accent, I'm not from here. Uh, I did my undergraduate uh, and master's uh, back at home in Iran. That's where I'm from. And both of them in urban planning. And when I was uh, getting those degrees, of course, much younger, much more um, uh, interested in things that were extremely difficult for me. Namely, at that point in time, I was very much interested in how using planning theories we can change the political environment of a very oppressive country. So I was interested in application of planning theories to building better public spaces and very much interested in philosophy, so on and so forth. Then of course, um, things changed. I decided to, after I finished my master's and I had quite a lot of, in, quite a lot of fun uh, doing that kind of work, I came to the US and um, ended up in Texas, very close to a place where Hurricane Ike in 2008 had happened. And I started uh, thinking about, okay, am I going to pursue my theory, theory, theory um, path, uh, staying in the library, or am I going to um, kind of expand, switch, and become more applicable? Um, Given where I had landed, given the circumstances of the school I was in, and more and most importantly, seeing a very um, lively and passionate, passionate from the locals, a process of residents of this small island city, Galveston, Texas, getting so involved, uh, more than about 400 of them, uh, dedicating months and months of work to making decisions about how they want to rebuild their city after a very devastating hurricane, I realized that, oh, okay, there is this interest in uh, communicative rationality and planning theory. I can apply that to the very contentious and conflict-ridden um, decisions that have to be made after a disaster for long-term recovery. So that was kind of where my shift happened. And I had this very influential, lovely professor who um, had a great uh, interest in quantitative social sciences. And that made a huge impact on me in terms of the work I do, part of the work I do today, which is measuring and tracking the disparities in how much money does everybody get after a disaster and how that exacerbates into different types of 
inequalities in land ownership, um, the assets people have, so on and so forth. So that's kind of my story of how I got into here uh, to this point. I was a planning professor in a different school for four years, but I but that was in the Midwest. I really wanted to focus all of my disaster research on coastal issues um, and, and flood and surge and hurricane types of disasters. So here I found this great opportunity with this great group of people who do interdisciplinary work on different aspects of hurricanes, flood mitigation, flood prediction, so on and so forth. And I can be the urban planner who looks at the land use planning and decisions and policies that can be changed to actually get our communities to a, a safer harbor, to make sure that we have smaller amounts of losses in property, in people's lives, so on and so forth, when disasters happen. Now, I did tell you a little bit of the work that I do, the types of projects I work on. And um, one of the most, I think, exciting projects that I'm involved in with right now is this truly really interdisciplinary work with a large group of civil engineers, computer scientists, mechanical engineers, and all of these programmers who together, we are building a decision support tool. It's a software. My role in that project is to make sure that actual community members, decision makers, stakeholders, they actually use that decision support tool to decide do we build a levy here or not? Do we retrofit our public library or not? How much do we spend on um, um, changing the location of public housing projects, those kinds of things? So that is a type of research engagement work that I do. And I think that is really um, going to have real impact. If you are like some of my other um, um, undergraduate students, it's interesting that almost 50% of the students that I work with on a regular basis in different research projects, they are undergraduates. And I don't know exactly how that happens, but my, my feeling is that when you are so intimately engaged in class with students throughout semesters, you really get to get excited about the talent and interest and passion and the young minds that they have. So it's just every semester, at least one or two of them um, join my research group and um, they get to work on very exciting opportunities um, related to um, land use for mitigation, post-disaster recovery decision making, so on and so forth. And if you are interested in doing field work, field research, right after a disaster, I know it might sound a little bit chaotic, but it's also extremely exciting and amazing learning experience. Um, I always have opportunities for field research um, for students who are involved with my group. Um, you can easily find my contact information and I would love to hear from you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my amazing colleague, Professor David Taylor, who is going to who is tell you all about uh, environmental humanities. David. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everybody. How are you? Um, just real quickly, I think sometimes the, the perception of Long Island is that it looks like New York City. This is about three miles from my backyard. And that's my kayak that I take out on the ocean. Oh, well, not right now because it's far too cold. But during the summer, I try to be on the water as much as possible. Um, so uh, I'm uh, David Taylor. I'm the faculty director for environmental humanities, which um, is a degree that I think is uh, unique within uh, SOMAS because of its focus on the role humanities can play in the questions of environmental engagement, uh, climate change, and um, by engagement, I mean actually decision making. Um, and I think the way to sort of talk about the, how I got into this is is a different one. So um, I, I'm a first generation college student. Uh, my parents came from West Texas. Uh, my father, well, my grandparents on my dad's side were basically sharecroppers. And my mom grew up on a small cattle ranch. It was about 350,000 acres. And so as a little kid, uh, we would go out to these places and I would have to work with the animals and I would uh, do all of the jobs that they would give to, you know, a five to 10 year old to take care of. So by the time I got to the, to the university at 18, 
I had spent a lot of time outdoors. I was, I, I really enjoyed being a, a sort of amateur naturalist. I really enjoyed identifying things. But much like Dean Shepson said earlier, when I got to the university, unfortunately, I didn't find someone in environmental science. I wish I had. Instead, I found an English professor who really took me aside and started to teach me to think about the stories that I had heard and to hear and understand how my, the ethics and moralities of my community shaped the things that I valued. And so in some ways it came to me to be this moment where I wanted to find a way to link my passion and love for story, for philosophy, for the ways that community, communities make decisions with my passion for the environment, for my love of being outdoors. Um, and I'll be honest, at the time when I was that young in the 80s, th there wasn't such a uh, program. So uh, I went on to do my doctorate and PhD and I was among the first uh, few PhDs in English to actually write a dissertation on the history of science. And it was about this idea that I wanted to find a way to link this passion that I had with this other field. Throughout my career, I've always wanted them not to be just in one department, but I've wanted to find a way in which I can see, and, and, and Sarah and some of my other colleagues, we think this like this in SOMAS, that we can be very specialized in our field, but we find that um, there's much more creative possibility and there's maybe even more uh, sort of resonance with what our work does when we talk across our fields and we listen and learn from our colleagues and we find new opportunities to do work and to also engage our students. Um, one of the things that I really enjoy is I teach an environmental ethics class and most of my students are from the sciences. And by the end, we actually work on a case study about the sciences and then sort of apply sort of ethical models to see how this works out, to see that ethics can help us make decisions about engaging community and even about the values that we carry into these. So it was really important to me then a few years ago when I had the opportunity to come to uh, Stony Brook uh, with the sustainability studies program because I looked at my colleagues like Dr. Pachrin, Dr. Hamada and others who uh, were from different fields. And it was this moment that I, I really, and I still believe in this mission very much that as we diversify our knowledge and we bring in our, our passions when, when one field and we apply those and we look at how to work with others, we find really creative and innovative solutions to the problems that we're faced with. And as we often say in SOMAS now, you know, that climate change and some of the issues around this are this generation's and next generation's immediate problem. And in some ways, this is that moment where interdisciplinarity is more important than ever. And so it's the one where I would encourage you in your, your work to stay passionate about what it is that you truly want and be open and creative to hear other possibilities. Because it may mean something like you might, like, like the Niels, write about cockroaches someday, right? And you may learn a great deal in your own work from that. And that's, I think the best, that's probably my favorite part of SOMAS is on Fridays, we do these lectures and it can be from, from so many different fields and so many different interests. And I find all of them really engaging because it carries with it this connection that we have to bring the disciplines together to have this broader conversation. In light of that environmental humanities is a major that is focused on communication, outreach, and value systems, cultural understanding of environmental problems. Um, my students though, I, I'm a big believer, my students need to be doing internships. They need to be doing uh, work before they graduate. So like right now, I just had a meeting before this one with uh, Dr. Loiza, one of my students and the UN ambassador for Tanzania. And she'll be interning with the ambassador for the next year, uh, working on outreach work. I have three students working with me now on a story map project about the Hudson River and value systems. And then I have another student interning um, with a, um, a, a sort of ocean preservation group in Maine. 
So I really work hard to make my students take these things that might otherwise seem a little uh, sort of high-minded in that sort of humanities way, but I, but I try to remind them that there's so many possibilities for the ways that we go about constructing value systems and using that as a way to help the groups understand the application of good science. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm going to pass this on to my wonderful colleague, Michael French. Thanks, David. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm uh, honored today to represent uh, Division of Atmospheric Sciences. And so to any of you out there who are interested in meteorology or atmospheric science, um, it's a wonderful part of uh, SOMAS here. So a little bit about me, which could maybe explain the photo in the background there. Um, I'm actually from uh, New England. I'm from this area. So um, I grew up in Connecticut. And when I was nine years old, uh, my town, Hamden, Connecticut, was hit by a violent tornado, which is one of only three that have ever hit New England. And um, it was uh, terrifying for me. It was, it was terrible. Um, I, I, it gave me anxiety for years and um, it, it just, at any time I thought that, you know, my, my house could get wiped out by a tornado. Um, I was also at the same time fascinated by the weather. And so then I went off to college and majored in atmospheric sciences. And I thought I had a pretty unique story. And it turned out that everyone that I went to school with that was majoring in atmospheric science was the same way. Um, they had pretty much been fascinated by the weather since they were a kid. And now it's almost cliche. Anybody you talk to that, that does atmospheric science, they always had this fascination with the weather when they were growing up. And um, I'm sure this is true for a lot of sciences, but I think in particular in meteorology, um, it's filled with people that are really uh, genuinely uh, curious about how the weather works and are, are very invested in, in understanding the science. So um, I, like many, went, to, went off to school and thought uh, I was going to be on TV. I was going to go into broadcast meteorology because that's just what you did. And I didn't realize at the time um, that there's whole other aspects of it that you could go off into, into do research or you could go work for a private company. Um, the many, many, indust uh, many industries uh, need meteorologists for, for various reasons, whether it be forecasts or, or what have you. And so I did you know, well enough in school and, and, and actually ended up going into graduate school. Um, that was in the Southern Plains. And I still had this fascination with uh, severe weather and tornadoes. And that's what I focused on. And so I spent 11 years in the Southern Plains um, actually uh, using radars that were mounted on trucks to chase tornadoes and, and collect high quality data of them. Um, and then I had a wonderful opportunity to come back to this part of the country and to join a program um, that has really been built up over the past 10 or 15 years. And so now we have, um, I believe, about 12 faculty on the atmospheric science side. And so whether you're interested in severe storms and tornadoes, or maybe you're interested in any other myriad of other topics, like tropical cyclones, or I'm sure many of you are interested in climate change. And we have 12 faculty that all do something slightly different. Um, and so a lot of areas, essentially every area in, in atmospheric science is covered. Um, that includes climate, that includes uh, snowstorms, that includes severe storms, um, any, anything that you're interested in, we have folks here that specialize in. And so um, I think it's uh, been a really wonderful opportunity to be part of a growing program that um, shows that you don't have to be uh, living in uh, Oklahoma or Texas to study severe storms. And in fact, one of the great things we have now is we've built up our own radar program. And so we have now our own radar mounted on a truck. And um, we're gonna be using that to, to collect data in storms, uh, snowstorms and severe storms. So uh, this is a, a really wonderful program. Um, and so whether you're interested in forecasting or um, like I thought I was going to be, or whether you're interested in going into research um, or joining the National Weather Service, we have a, th this is a great program that, that you can come and, and be a part of. 
Um, I know many of you are interested in undergraduate research and uh, I've had, uh, we have, like I said, faculty that kind of specialize in every area. So it, those opportunities are always there. And I've had a, I think one of the, the best parts of being a faculty member is, is actually been able to, to work with um, other undergrad, to, to work with undergraduates on, on research. Um, it's, it's been an absolute blast. So um, sensitive to your, to your time. So I wanna move on, but um, please uh, reach out and uh, you feel free to contact me or anybody else in atmospheric science if you have questions, those of you that are interested. And uh, I think we have a department here that will match your lifelong uh, fascination with the weather. So uh, I hope you can come and join us. Uh, with that, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to my awesome colleague, Dr. Leslie Thorne, and she's gonna talk to you about marine vertebrate uh, biology. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Michael said, I'm here to represent the MVB program in the Marine Sciences Division. Um, I'm a marine ecologist. I study the movements and habitat use and foraging behavior of seabirds and cetaceans, which are dolphins and whales, and also how they respond to environmental change and, and human pressures. As I'm from Canada, which you may or may not be able to tell um, from me talking today. I grew up in the province of Ontario in what I would call a city, but is a, a small town by American standards um, in the Thousand Islands regions. Um, and I went to the University of Guelph, which is about an hour west of Toronto. And I went there to study biology, but I really wasn't certain when I, when I started my undergraduate degree what I wanted to do. Um, I really liked writing. I, I considered going into English, in fact. Um, but I ended up becoming a marine biologist, although um, I grew up and went to school very far from the ocean. And a really influential factor in how I ended up becoming interested in the ocean uh, occurred in my first year of university when professors came into my Bio 101 class to talk about a series of summer field courses in the Bay of Fundy. And that seemed super exciting to me. And I applied to the program, I got in, and ended up spending three really incredible months taking field courses and playing in tidal pools in a really amazing place with the biggest tides in the world. And in that time, I also got to know the faculty members teaching us in small groups really well and got a good sense of what it would be like to do research for a living, which seemed pretty great to me. Um, I also got interested in connections between biology and, and physical oceanography, which is still a focus of some of my work. And I think in retrospect, it's clear to me just how much that experience as an undergrad altered the course of, of my life, really. Um, I ended up working at a research station in the Bay of Fundy every summer when I was an undergraduate. I got a ton of field and research experience, um, worked with researchers who I, I still work with today, 20 years later. Um, and ultimately, I went on to do my PhD at Duke. And, and after that, came straight to SOMOS when I finished my, my PhD. Um, I taught here for three years as a lecturer before I became an assistant professor and, and built up my research program and lab. And I think there are a lot of great things about being at SOMOS, but perhaps the most important for me um, are really the people. It, it's a really friendly and laid back atmosphere here. We have great and supportive colleagues and really fantastic students, both undergraduate and graduate students. Um, and also you're probably seeing this as, as kind of a theme um, among all the different speakers, but the diverse nature of this school is really special. Um, so I'm a biologist, but right here within SOMOS, we have people from a wide range of disciplines and I'm able to work closely with oceanographers and climate scientists, as well as biologists, which has been really important and also really influential on my, my research and the same for my students. Um, I also wanted to highlight um, the really great field and research opportunities that we have right on our doorstep here. So while some of my research is done in far off plant places in the subantarctic or in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, I also have research projects right in our backyard. So for example, my lab group does research on humpback whale um, behavior and body condition using drones. And to do this work, we use small boats and, and go right out of our Southampton um, Marine Station. We also conduct research on, on gulls, on herring gulls and blackback gulls uh, right here in Stony Brook. And um, for those of you that might have gone for a walk in Stony Brook Harbor, you might remember the little island um, that you look out at. Uh, and we work right there putting uh, GPS tags on birds and we kayak right over to our, our field site. So we have opportunities for students to come out in the field or to work in the lab or on the computer. Uh, in my group. And there are lots of really exciting opportunities and platforms for, for research 
uh, and courses here at SOMOS. Uh, and next, Brad Peterson is going to tell you about his background and his research examining um, seagrass ecosystems along the east coast of the U.S. Welcome. So uh, I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, in the fields of corn. I used to work on farms, bale hay. And uh, I know that what I do right now is not work because what I did when I was younger was work. I don't have to worry about getting up anymore. Uh, I find something, you guys are starting off right now, plotting your course of where life is gonna take you. And my greatest wish for you is you find that one thing that alarm clock is not needed to get up in the morning and go do what you do. And that's, that's what I have. Uh, I went to, at the time, I dreamed about going to the sea. I longed for that which I didn't have. There were seven programs in the United States that had a bachelor's degree in marine biology. And so I went to one of them and it was amazing. It was remarkable. As a junior, I got in a submersible and went 3000 feet down in the ocean. Unbelievable. It was an internship that I got. And from there, I just continued on my path, having one remarkable adventure after another. And now I've landed up here. I, I, uh, I haven't spent a January in New York since 2006, other than this year. I'm usually on a warm tropical island, like the picture behind me that I took in Jamaica. Um, the opportunities that you have as an undergraduate at Stony Brook are amazing. We've got internships at Moat Marine Lab. We've got people that are literally on a boat going to Antarctica, and they've got a bunk that you might be able to take. So the uh, marine science is a huge umbrella and the kinds of paths are amazing. I'm teaching a class right now online. And one of the things I'm trying to do to keep my class engaged is I have an expert minute where I bring someone in for 10 minutes. And all I've done is look through all the undergraduates that I've had. I've got a, a, a National Park Service ranger coming in one week. I've got a marine archaeologist coming in another week. I've got someone who's working with the Nature Conservancy on oyster restoration. I've got all these people from undergraduates who've gone through SOMAS and now have these jobs all over the planet coming in to talk to my class. So I, I am very excited for you as you think about where this next stage is going to take you and where you're going to go. All I can do is echo, um, I think this is an amazing place. One of the reasons, and I think as you're thinking about where you want to go, one of the things is I teach a class, I walk down two flights of steps, I step on a boat and I'm over in my, my habitats where I'm doing my research in 15 minutes. Being where we are is pretty impressive. Long Island is also the kind of a biogeographic barrier and we've had things coming from down south up north for the last decade. So you think you wanna learn about climate change? Come study it right here <laughs> on Long Island. Can I can I interrupt? You're having so much fun. You should be paying us. Thank you, everybody. That was really wonderful. I think we all have a much better understanding of what we can expect from uh, types of um, majors that we can pursue, research opportunities. Um, ways that we might find our path within not just Stony Brook, but the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. And I know that uh, Kamazima Louisa, who's um, had marked a couple of questions that were in the Q&A that he wanted to answer live. And I think this would be a great time to get that started. Thank you, Amanda. I'm Kamazima Luisa. I'm the director of the undergraduate programs. The, now, the, cool, the bad thing is, I don't remember which one I promised I'm going to answer. Can you, Amanda, can you help me pick them up and I'll answer them? Yes. Uh, the first one was, how does the school prepare students for graduate work and beyond? Ah, that's a good one. So, if you chose Stony Brook, that would be one of the big reasons why you did. Be one, number one, because we are one of the top schools 
in the country in the marine science field. And atmos atmospheric science and sustainability. What we do, we give you the basics. We give you the practice in terms of research and internships. And also we challenge you by trying to participate in the community, going into the community and trying to see what the problems are. And so our program is robust and coming from a, a school of high reputation, applying for graduate school is very easy. And also if it is work, just normal work, you'll be prepared. You're going there knowing what to do, not being shown how to do stuff because you're a newbie. Uh, next question, Amanda, if you can help me, please. Yes. Yeah, so the next question that we have from one of our guests today is um, for the college experience at Stony Brook, how do students, um, I'm guessing within SOMAS, um, feel about having a split campuses for marine science? Or how does the Southampton campus and the main campus work? Do students feel connected or disconnected? That's a great question. So the having Southampton, in fact, is an advantage. One, the, the first year when you come, you spend most of your time on, 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 on the main campus because we're teaching you the basics in terms of you got to know calculus, biology, chemistry, physics. You get that, that's the foundation. Once you have the scaffolding, and it's tight, then we allow you to branch out. Now, when you go to Southampton, as Professor Peterson said, literally, he was not lying. You might think it's a fib, it's not, it's true. You walk out, you can stretch your hand and touch water. And there are boats there just for teaching. We have boats for research, both for teaching. So there's availability of space for you to go and do research. You can walk on the beach when you don't even need a boat. So the Southampton facility is there to allow students to be able to engage with the, with the, with the, with the environment. And we have, we have buses between the two campuses, so almost, almost about every hour. So you can take, you can take your class on main campus and then in the next hour or so, you'd be in Southampton and doing your thing and being in the water or just walking on the beach. So that's, that's it's, it's not quite a split, it's kind of a di divided focus in the sense that when you wanna do field work, you have the facility to do that. And we have even another one, which you've not mentioned, the Flux Pond, which is just, up here in, St in Stonybrook, you can go and uh, and 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 uh, and work on 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 species you want. We have a, a field station, so it's, it's 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 not quite a split. And in fact, it it just adds variety of things you can do while it, at Stonybrook. We also have a question um, about whether there is any specific research on uh, deep sea marine biology, um, specifically involving the difference, differences between those species and more common ones? Ha, huh. so I'm gonna partially answer that and then I'll throw it back to Dr. Peterson. Um, <clears throat> the, the first one which comes to mind, we have uh, Professor Warren. He, he works with, with, with whales. He's a cool guy, he's, he's Mr. Whales. So, and what I like, he, 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 he's interested in, in creel. So the creel is the, the little things. And can you imagine working with the little things and this humongous guy around? And he, he manages to combine those two, which is, I think is pretty good. I, I'm a physicist. So I'm always amazed how biologists can combine those two things. It's, it's just amazing. So, that, that's an example that easily comes to mind, but uh, Dr. Peterson might want to add anything he, he has to say. 
Joe is the guy I was thinking of. He uses acoustics and sound to find out what's down below, uh, but he, they also do field toes uh, to, to kind of verify what they're looking at. And if you go to Warren, W-A-R-R-E-N underscore bioacoustics, you'll get to his Instagram where he's got all kinds of pictures of anglers and weird fish that they, uh, they catch when they do their net trawls. Amanda, bring them on. I think you know I'm getting, I'm getting it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a really good question: Is the marine science field very competitive? Of course it is. I'm a marine scientist. <laughs> um, yes, it is. If it's in terms of can you get in or not get in, you you you're gonna have to show that you've got you you got the brains to get in. So there's competition there. Yes. Um, when it comes to the to getting work, there's still competition. But as I said earlier, you have an advantage. You are coming from a, one of the top schools in the field, so it it gives you a huge advantage when you go there with the big name of the school. Nobody is going to ask you, "Where did you come from?" You say, "Stonebrook." I say, "Where is that again?" I, anybody in the marine science field, you say Stony Brook, they know what you're talking about. So in those terms, you, you, you have a big advantage to come to Stony Brook. And another question, which is better for getting a job after graduation, earning a degree in general biology or a degree in marine science? And I'm guessing they're asking about getting a job within the field of marine science. Right. So the, here is the, the traditional way in marine science, and that's how I did it. That's why I, I don't have any hair anymore. It's that long ago. I did physics and mathematics. My majors were physics and mathematics. And after my bachelor's, I went for my master's in ocean physics and then did my PhD again in ocean physics. And some people in my field would go in engineering and then come to do ocean physics. And for people who are in the, in the, in the biological oceanography or marine biology, they would start doing marine biology or ecology. And then they'll, in their uh, graduate work, they will go into the field of marine biology or fisheries, uh, whichever the field. And the same thing with the atmospheric sciences. So that's how it used to be. But now you don't have to wait that long. You can cut that chase. And that's why we have the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. You come here, we'll give you, Stonebrook will give you all the foundation of science you need and humanities you need in order to pursue the field you're interested in. So you get the best of both worlds at the same time and shorten the time. And which actually reminds me, I haven't seen a question on that, but we have a, 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 a combination of a bachelor and a master's accelerated program. So you, you do your three years, after three years, you apply to a combined bachelor's master's so in your fourth year, you are doing your bachelor's at the same time doing your graduate school. So in five years, you're done. You have your master's and your bachelor's at the same time. So we have um, a couple more questions. I know we're just past five o'clock, so we really appreciate you all sticking around with us. Um, one uh, question came in, and these are actually really similar. Um, what's life like after graduating with a marine science degree? And what type of nonprofit job opportunities can graduating with a degree in marine science, um, you know, I guess, gain you? But I think the, the nonprofit job opportunities would apply really to any SOMAS majors, not just marine science. Right. That's a great question and uh, I'm gonna try and answer it and uh, my colleagues might also help me out. Um, I can think of the Sierra Club, Nature Conservancy, um, um, the UN, 
it's not a, an NGO, it's a semi kind of government. And lots of uh, NGOs which are pro environment would, would definitely employ you because you go with the, with the expertise of knowing how to make maps, you have GIS expertise, you know the science, all the background, you, 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 if it is sustainability, you, you know all the, 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 the terms, the rules of engagement in that field. So that, that would apply to any, 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 any um, NGO that deals with the, with the, with the, with this, with this, with the science. Um, but I, I want to allow any of my colleagues who might want to help out and in, in terms of answering that question. Now, it's not just NGOs. The government does employ that. There was a, I, I, in fact, I answered that question in one of the, uh, when I was trying to, to type. You, you, you can be employed by EPA, you can be employed by uh, DEC, the Department of uh, Environmental Conservation, Conservation, or DEP, they're almost the same, depends on which state or town you are in. NOAA, NASA, um, what did I leave out? Uh, and the local governments, like uh, you, 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 the count, count, counties and, uh, and cities, National Park Service, they all employ our, our students. And uh, there was another question which asked me, how much would I make if after I graduate? And normally it ranges, I'm going to say, about 48 to 70,000 a year. That's what I see, depending on the field. Uh, if you go into like, what is the bend of chemistry or physics, it, it gets higher. Anybody want to help me out on the NGOs, the question on NGO? Uh, it looks like everybody thinks I answered it. Correctly, I don't see. Let me see. Yeah. 